Hey, welcome to another episode of The Big Three and Me. I'm your host, Akil Patterson, joined by my co-host, Akeem Hunt, Dominique Hamilton, and our little minion, as always, Andrew Forte. And this week, our special guest is Alex Pernali, who is a soccer player, former University of Maryland Terrapin, uh, and I believe you paid down in Alabama now, right? Yes, sir. Uh-oh. All right. So we got a great show for you guys. Remember, this is the big three and me. So let's start with Alex. Alex, welcome to the show. Um, we're super excited to have you on the big three and me. Um, so let's talk about like a little bit about where you're coming from, your career trajectory, and actually why we decided to have you on in the first place was because you become the first MLS soccer player in history to take his salary in a little thing called cryptocurrency. You're getting paid in Bitcoin? Yes, sir. So I'll, I'll correct you. I was, there, there was already an MLS player, but I was the first USL. Um, but yeah, um, thanks for having me on, guys. I'll just give you a little rundown on my background. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Grew, was born and raised there, grew up playing all sorts of sports. And then obviously soccer was the one that I um, really succeeded in. So took me to the University of Maryland, where I played there for four years uh, while I was at Maryland. Yeah, I go Terps. Studied economics. Um, graduated from Maryland in, in 2016. And then I signed in, in MLS with the Columbus crew, which was home for me. So I went back home to Columbus, played there for three years. And then this is my... I just finished up my second year in Birmingham, Alabama with the, the Birmingham Legion. And um, yeah, in, in 2021, just a, you know, two, three months ago, I uh, met these guys at this company called Bitwage. And I, I'd been buying Bitcoin over the last year, you know, pretty heavily trying to allocate as much, much money as I could into it. Um, and, you know, they, they explained this process of taking salary in Bitcoin. And I thought it was, a you know, a, a great idea to do because I'm already um, making the, the purchases on my own. I'm dollar cost averaging into it. So why not make it every two weeks and just streamline the whole process? So um, yeah, I became the first USL player to, to take percentage of my salary in Bitcoin. And, and here we are today. I was able <clears> to connect with you guys in Twitter spaces with the Gokstein media stuff. And, you know, here we are. And that's why I got my shirt. I got to struggle on my shirt. Get paid in Bitcoin. You Super got dope. the wage on the back. Yeah. Oh, nice. I'm not I need one of those. I want one of those too, man. Super dope. Not until Bitwage is a sponsors a show at uh, $25,000 a show. That's <laughs> that's when we let them on for free. <laughs> nothing you, By the way, nothing you hear here is financial advice. This is entertainment. We are a lifestyle brand thing. I mean, we could be talking about tiddlywinks and Pokemon cards for all I care. But... Uh, no, let's so tell us about the bit so bit pay, bit wage. Yeah, yeah, bit wage. They're they've been around for I think near a decade now, um, helping people uh, you know accept their salary in, in cryptocurrency from you know all walks of life. They 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 support individual consumers as well as payroll for entire companies and they uh, the, the process is is so easy. You know, they with their system, you, you get set up on their platform and you just have your payroll provider designate whatever percentage of your salary, just direct deposit it to Bitwage. They convert it on their end and, you know, it gets transferred directly into your into your crypto wallet. Um, and it's no fees on the consumer side. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's super simple and, and, and easy. Nice. So, um, so Alex, is this kind of like a, um, a third party, like a third party that, um, I guess your team go through to pay you or you do, you have to set that all up yourself? Yeah. So I didn't actually go through my team at all. I just was able to connect with our, our HR, um, our third party payroll provider. And I asked them to, you know, Hey, take 15% of my salary and send it over to these guys at Bitwage. The other 85% just direct deposit into my bank account like normal. And then Bitwage takes care of the rest. So it's super easy. Um, you don't have to you know, go through the, the corporate ladder trying to get permission from 
you know, the president of your company or the president of my team and uh, go through all those steps. So it, it was uh, honestly, it, it's super easy and super seamless from these guys. Dom, are you trying to lean over to hit your uh, unmute button? <laughs> it was like Dom was really leaning over to hit the unmute, but then he just probably he's probably selling more uh, Bitcoin now that you're on here, going, "All right, I need to sell this for some Ethereum." <clears throat> um, That's true. Uh, <laughs> so, Alex, uh, in terms of uh, your career trajectory and getting to to the to, to playing professionally. Um, you, you made it kind of seem like really simple, but it's not simple by any means. And, and, and kind of walk us through that process uh, of getting to be a professional athlete. I mean, cause I know a lot of kids will end up thinking, you know, it, it takes 35 seconds and, and, a, and a Twitter account to be on, on, uh, on this fine show, but no, you actually have a long career path in order to get to a place where you are able to say, look, I'm accepting my, professional sports career pay in Bitcoin. Yeah, well, I, I grew up playing all sorts of sports. You know, I played basketball, baseball, and soccer growing up until I was about 14 or 15 years old when um, I made the decision to stop playing baseball, stop playing basketball, and just focus on soccer. And at the time, I was playing for um, the Columbus Crew Academy. So those of you who may or may not be aware of the, the soccer um infrastructure here in the United States, MLS teams have their own youth academies where they pay for these kids. And, and when I was playing, it was just 16 year olds and above, but now they have 14 year old teams, 12 year old teams. Every year it's like it gets younger and younger where they're paying for these kids equipment. They're paying for their travel. They're paying for, um, they're, they're paying for them to play. So as a young kid, you're already kind of in this environment where you like feel like you're a pro. It's like, I don't have, my parents don't have to pay for me to go to soccer practice. Like that, that's a pretty powerful thing. Um, so when I made that jump to the Columbus Crew Academy at 15, 16 years old, I was focusing, everything was soccer, soccer, soccer. You know, that was, that was the, my life at, at that point in time. And I loved it. Um, you know, we would go to showcases and there would be lined up coaches on the sideline, 20, 30, 40, 50 college coaches who are there recruiting you. Um, that was the place to be. If you were my age, you wanted to be on one of these MLS Academy teams because that's where the exposure was and that's where the talent was. So I played there for, you know, a few years and I didn't really, I wasn't confident I could go pro until I was like 16 years old and I was able to, you know, start training with the crew first team with the professional team and they would bring up some young guys and let you train with them, be in, be in that professional environment. And you can see like the margins, once you get to a certain level in professional sports, the margins are really small. So an MLS player, like a bottom of the table, MLS player, like lowest on the team to like the best player. It's like small margins. The main thing is consistency. Once you get to that level, a lot of guys have the talent, but okay, are you going home and doing the right things when you get home, eating well, recovering, coming back the next day and playing well each and every day? And that's how, you know, guys like LeBron James or Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, these guys, they're, they're good every time they step on the field or the court. Um, and that's really the difference between the best and, and those who, who are just good. Um, so I was able to, to get exposure at the professional ranks and, um, you know, through playing with the crew Academy and playing at those showcases, I was recruited by, by Sasho at the university of Maryland. And I, I had a different college recruiting process than most because it was the first offer I got from Maryland. And I was, it was the summer before my, my junior year of, of high school. So I was only, I might've been 17, 16 or 17. So I was still pretty young when I decided to commit. Cause then I still had another two years of, playing academy before I actually went to school. So I knew really early. And I think I was, I was lucky in that sense where I, I was able to get that out of the way. Um, you know, wasn't thinking about what, what I was going to do next. I knew I was going to Maryland. So then the next two years, it was just preparing for Maryland. And because I um, committed so early, I, I realized like I didn't need to <laughs> waste my time in high school 
for my last semester as a senior. And in Ohio, it's pretty easy to, to graduate early. Like I took one summer class where they mailed me, it was like a history class. They mailed me a booklet of like all the, essentially all the questions that I would, that would need answered. And then you can just like go online and you like find the answer. It was kind of like a joke. So I did this class in the summer before my senior year. And then I took three classes, was done by 11 a.m. every day. And then I graduated a semester early from high school. So I graduated in December from high school, went to Maryland in 2013, in January of 2013. So I was able to kind of get my feet wet. This was the off season for soccer. So meet the guys, um, get, get uh, exposed to school and, and start my schooling there at Maryland before the, my freshman season of 2013. Um, and went into to school as a freshman 2013, did really well, started, you know, started my first games at Maryland, hit a rough patch, was benched. You know, you go through the ups and downs of, of being a college athlete, right? I, I thought at one point I talked to the coach about transferring. I thought, you know, I don't think he liked me as a player, this and that. He's like, no, you should stay. I'm like, okay, fine. And then I, you know, stayed junior year. I was captain alongside another guy. We won conference championships four years in a row. Senior year, I was first team all America and then you know graduated and and signed in Columbus um and my journey really was a lot of ups and downs you know it, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows there was in order for me to get to where I needed to be there was like a huge setback and you know in college it was my freshman year I played the first 12 games and then I was benched didn't play the rest of the season didn't see the field um and then I came back sophomore year and I was not a starter yet, you know, that I was still, I would play some games, not play other games, play some games, not play other games. And then by the end of my sophomore year, I kind of solidified that like, okay, I'm here, I'm going to start. And then junior and senior year is really when I started to elevate my game um, before signing pro. But that's kind of the quick rundown of, of where I came from in my soccer journey getting me here Alex, today. What was, Alex, what was, the, what was the kind of the moment in time when you knew you could go pro? You knew that, oh, I had potential, I can actually do this thing. You, you mentioned you were 16. What was that? What was that moment if there was one? Yeah, I, I don't know if there was an exact moment, but it, it was really like I was describing, you know, we're playing for the crew academy. So every day we're looking up to the first team guys. And for me, I'm a center back. And it was Chad Marshall, who was, you know, MLS Defender of the Year national team player had been playing in the MLS for a decade or whatever. And I looked at him as like, I want to be that player. So I was able to, to see his game, model my game after him. Um, and then I, I was able to train with him. They would invite us to, to go and play with those guys. And it was, it was when I was in the practice with, with the Columbus crew first team at the time. And I was able to see like, okay, I'm not that far off, you know, technically I'm, I'm like right there. I just have to, you know, improve here or like get stronger here, get faster or whatever it may be. But it was, it was when I trained with the, the, the first team that I really realized, okay, like I can do this, you know? Black go. I was trying to pound it over to Dom, but Dom, Dom looked like he reading a book over there. No, I can't hear you. <laughs> He's on mute. He looks like he's having a day. <laughs> he's about to go off. Uh, so what we're going to say is, Alex, uh, so one of the questions I had was, what? how is that even legal that you can play or work out with a professional team? Um, because, you know, you know, for me, and, and, and I don't know, Akeem and Dom probably, you know, we're all former football players. You can't take a, an ice cream sandwich from a professional sports club, let alone they can pay for all your travel and 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 uh, and, and meals and and practice time. So, like you know, what's up with that? I'm yeah, really jealous. I, I mean, they the rules have since changed. Obviously, now you know guys can get paid, and I think the whole dynamic has changed. But they never, you know, they never paid us, right? It was just they covered our expenses. So they, like, sponsored us as players. Um, 
but I, I don't know. I never thought about like, like they were paying us, you know, and there's, there's obviously a, um, you know, a rule that allows it, but, but that's what in the soccer world, um, that's what the top clubs are doing. They're, they're paying for these guys. They're, they're paying for them. So in some clubs they have, uh, like apartment complexes and they pay for guys from Florida to come play with them in Ohio and live there year round. And these kids are like 14, 15 years old. So they're recruiting now to play at these, these clubs. Competition is real. That's pretty yeah. cool. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that. That's what they should be doing in all sports. Yeah. Right. Hey. You want the best, bring them in, you know, pay the best coaches to train these kids until they're, you know, whatever, when they're, 10 years old until they're 18. Yeah, fuck you, pay me. That's what I would like to say. Fuck you, <laughs> pay me. That also, is... does that ruin some of the politics for younger ages when they're playing sports? I feel like it might be more competitive and the parents and politics might be kind of more uh, drastic. Say that again? Do you feel like that because there's so much competition at a younger age? Like those, those kids in that age group, like – there might be more politics involved with who starts, who doesn't start, who's going to make it, who's not going to make it. Like there's kind of more like, it's kind of more like a doggy dog. Would you say? Yeah. I mean, that's how, that's how it is as a pro. Right. Um, but the beauty of it is. But do you really want to put those kids in that environment though? Cause like the sport's supposed to be fun, right? You're supposed to, you're supposed to, you know, love the sport among other things. It's not from being paid for them. And I feel like if you're kind of taking that approach when you're a little kid, you might, you might fall out of love with it. Yeah, I think it's just ex it's exposing them to what they would see if they were to make it as a professional at an early age. Mm. And and the thing is, if you know, because these parents aren't paying for their kids to travel, they're not paying for their gear. If the parent says, "Hey, you need to play my kid. You need to play my kid," the coach can say, "Fuck you. We're yeah, paying for your kid." You know, <laughs> it's so so the the Thanks. parent aspect actually isn't as bad as it as it was like when I was younger, and it was like okay, my parents are paying, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars to take me on this trip to Florida and play with my friends. And if they fly down there and watch their kids sit on the bench, then there's an issue. But if they're, you know, we're getting this amazing opportunity where we can play this sport without having to pay for it. Um, so I guess, you know, there's definitely, there's always competition at every level. Um, and if, if you don't like it as a player, then, I mean, I guess you can go and play on a, a lower level team you can go that's pay facts. for it and that's exactly you know that's the choice you're making but i i think it it makes that that part of it um less of an issue just because the club is taking on the risk absolutely nice. yeah I, 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 I actually that's kind of like interesting that you're explaining all of this because it's like it's like a you can look at this as like a somebody that's overseeing everything you can look at this as like a study case because like Let's be honest, bringing kids up in a fairy tale world, thinking everybody can make it when we all know everybody can't make it. And then when dreams get crushed, now kids have just built their whole belief on I can make it, I can make it, I can make it. Then when the dreams get crushed, it's like they don't know themselves. So it's like, I feel like introducing them to that stimulus at a young age is maybe... <laughs> I, I see where Forte is coming from, but it may be the best approach in terms of like, I guess we can bring this deep to, you know, the economy too. Because like, if you got the kid, you know, thinks they're good and they're actually good, they're going to actually keep going up to the levels. But then if you have a kid that takes competition the wrong way, they'll fall out of love with it. And maybe they'll, you know, fall in love with something that's actually fitting for them at a younger age and they can continue to, you know, enhance that. So that, that's kind of a, a good little deal they, they got going. You know, uh, so think this is, oh, go ahead. Uh, so let me ask you this. Do you know any athletes that you're currently playing with or on other teams <clears throat> that are only playing for the money and not so much for the because they love the sport? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, because once you get – as a pro, it's, it's different um, because everyone's there. It's like you guys said, a dog-eat-dog. -dog. So you're there. You're either – you're playing for – some guys are, are still playing just because they love the game, you know, yeah. which is great. A lot of guys are playing for money, for their family, for, you know, their personal just like brand or they want to win. Um, but everyone's motivation is different. And that's 
that's the beauty of it. Once you get to a certain level, you know, everyone has, it's so diverse, right? Guys from all over the world, guys from all different circumstances. Some guys already came from money. So they're just like, fuck it. I'm having fun. Other guys came from, you know, we're dirt poor in Africa and they come over and now this is their opportunity, right? They're playing for their life. Um, so and do you think, Alex, do you think the motivation of each player determines how successful they can be in the league? Because I, I, tend, I tend to have this notion in my brain, correct me if I'm wrong, that those that truly love the sport will be the most successful at it because they love what they do. You're wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> you I, think so? No, I, 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 I don't think you're necessarily wrong. I think that certainly plays a role because when you hit adversity, right, if, if you're only playing for the money and you, you hit adversity, um, you know, you, you get cut by this team, the next team is only going to pay you 50% of whatever that, that first team paid you. And then it's like, fuck, do I really want to go in another year of preseason, another year of training for less money because I'm doing this for the money. But if you're a guy who's like, I love playing football, I love playing soccer, I'm just going to go give it another year, give it another shot, then you can, you know, uh, play your way through some of the adversity. Um, so I, I think that definitely plays a role. And that also plays a role in how long you play. Mm -hmm. if the money's not there and you just, you know, it's weighing, there, there's so many different variables to it, right? Lifestyle you want, location where you want to live, um, flexibility. If you want to go travel and enjoy your friends, then you don't want to be locked down to one location playing a sport. So um, there's I kind think, of choices I think out there. Akil might hate this, but I think that Tom Brady truly, truly loves the game. Aside from winning as much as he does, I think he really loves the game. I think that's why he's been around, been around as long as he's been. Aside from the competitive edge and whatnot, like look at him, look at look at him rolling his eyes. He really hates Tom. He's a Baltimore fan. It's unfortunate to hear, but you know, I, th I think that that sport is. I think it's. I don't know if it's going to be the same as like football, but I know in the pros you can tend to you fall in love with the game out of the game because of the politics involved with it, like in. I mean, that's, I was just talking about the other day. I mean, it, it's it stopped being about the best guy on the field plays. You know what I mean? It's it's about everything else that's around. I don't know if it's the same, you know, with you, but I know in football it was like that. I don't know if the, if it, if it correlates or not. No, it's similar. Pro sports is pro, is pro sports. You know, the guys with the brand, the guys with who came in with their reputation it's important but i also think this idea you know that i described with the academy is can be attributed to like the rest of the economy so if i'm like google or one of these big tech firms why not build my own school or my own like education system that is training these young kids these individuals how to code or how to do, do whatever the job is from a young age train them so that once they're 18 19 years old they don't even have to go to college. They're already ready to go. You hire them straight into your workforce. And because I think that's on like a global scale, there's, there's competition in this economy. And I think America has gotten away from that competitive edge because of I know, softness. People, feel, people are soft. People feel bad. They don't want their kid to, to lose or whatever. And it's like, you know, we're just going to be left behind because these other countries like China, they're they're not playing that same game that we are. <laughs> Competition makes you great. Yeah. Agreed. I don't know. I, I think competition has its place and its limitations. Um, but, but I, you know, I just, I don't know how, I don't know if I would have played an additional season. So like my additional season after I got cut was I did some uh, arena football and I don't think I'd, I, I don't think I'd ever do like, literally that was when I was like, nah, this ain't worth it. The $76,000 check that I was getting was not worth what I was feeling physically. I was just like, I can do this somewhere else and, and make just as much. I could be a, I could get a job as a janitor and make $76,000 a year. I'm out. Uh -huh. Yep. And just going back on, um, touching on Forte side, like, yeah. Uh, you know, and you know, Alex, uh, going through adversity and going through it and actually uh, coming from the end of it, like, yeah, most people, you know, they build themselves up that way. But then once you start going down the line of, I guess, like that adversity line, and some of the leagues, 
you got coaches that are only there for the pay. So if they don't love it, but you're supposed to be getting, you know, criticism, constructive criticism and feedback from them, it's like, at that point, are they really building up the player? So then it goes back down to the player of, you know, what they feel is best for them or what, what you know, what's worthy to them. So it's like, I, I feel like if we're talking system wise, like it, it starts from the top and it just trickles down and like, the politics, you know, the politics is crucial when it comes to competition in these um, pro sports love because it's all about paying and building the actual, you know, organization and company. So I feel like, you know, once that gets fixed, then we can start developing some financial freedom throughout the whole I, system. I, that yeah, I don't know that it's getting that's, fixed, though. Yeah, it's, no, it, it would never get fixed. You know, I'm just you know, speaking in terms of like, just, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Money well, talks. I, I think that's a good segue into crypto then, Akeem. I think, uh, you know, we, we can close out that competition part. We can just kind of roll into that crypto <clears throat> scene where effectively. So Akeem Hunt is our is our crypto kind of uh, soothsayer. You know, he plays in the crypto world. He finds that gem. And so, Akeem, why don't you talk a little bit with Alex about, you know, his crypto aspirations and the things that he's playing in. You know what I mean? No doubt. So, Alex, uh, I see, you know, you the Bitcoin, you know, getting paid in Bitcoin. So is there I just want to ask, like, is there any other like cryptocurrencies that you're, you know, fun with or in tune with right now and studying? Yeah, I mean, Ethereum obviously is there. That's one that I've been buying. And and I actually I kind of, you know, with Bitwage, I can switch the allocation around. So like this last paycheck, I, I got some Ethereum as well. So I can nice. like I can play with it. Um, so uh, Ethereum's one, you know, Cardano's one that that I've had, you know, since early 2021. Um, that's probably one that I'll I'll hold. You know, I I uh, I started staking in Olympus DAO a few months ago. That's yes. one that like those those protocols are. I don't exactly understand what the hell is going on. Um, but like, like I try to like do my, I try to do as much research as I can, but once it gets into the weeds with the, the bonding and, and the, the different, you know, it's, it's like, it's anyways, I, you know, I, I can't explain what's going on there. Like I've read enough to be like, okay with it, to take that personal risk for no doubt, you know, the next six months to a year, see what happens. But um and then there's some smaller coins that i'll i'll get in and out of um you know omi is one that that i recently got look at his face know, look four, at his face, four t- four look t- at his face. <laughs> um and uh so yeah i i i don't have the time to do the deep digging in in a lot of the the smaller altcoins um but i you know i i try to st- stay in tune and see what's going on like solana is one that i wish i I, uh, you know, that's when I'm bullish on, I, I would love nice. to own that one, but because I bought Cardano earlier, it's like, I'm just going to sit tight and not get in on the end of this, the, the Solana train, but you know, I'm always following them and there's always going to be another bear season that, that we'll be able to make moves and, and reallocate. But, um, I yeah, I mean, so what do you, um, in terms of just to get some like, uh, you know, educational points. Do you see more of a gain from you know the smaller arts that you just named, like you know the Cardanos or the uh, OMIs, and you know even the Olympus Dow, you know the staking protocol? Do you see more gains there instead of you know going all in on Bitcoin right now? Potentially, I think there's the because they're smaller market cap. If mm-hmm. Um, but there's also so many, di- so, you know, Cardano is, is similar to Ethereum, which is similar to Solana. And I'm sure there's some other smaller blockchain protocols. So if we just look at those as like a utility standpoint and the competition, like developers have, have been developing on Ethereum, they've been working on Ethereum, um, in the history. And then that has since changed and Solana is becoming a lot more popular because it's lower fees. And, you know, Cardano has its aspects that would make Cardano more appealing. Um, They could all survive, but I think with a lot of these altcoins, there's going to be like the one or like a few that survive, which will get great gains. 
But then if, if you're picking the wrong horse and, and it's tough to know that and unless you're in the weeds, you like talk to these developers who are working on these platforms because that's where, that's where you should be investing. Follow where the developers are going because that's who's going to build this ecosystem that we're all going to be living in um, in terms of cryptocurrency. So I would say Bitcoin is like the safest. Bitcoin is one like I don't even have to think if, if uh, you know, Bitcoin's price action, whatever happens, like I'm still looking at five, 10 years down the line. So I'm, I'm extremely bullish on Bitcoin. I have oh, no problem putting things into Bitcoin. I think Ethereum is, is another great one. It's like the, the second horse. It's, um, but there's going to be, there's going to be other ones that are going to have outsized returns. And we've seen it like this year with Solana, like you can't, Bitcoin has become, you know, it's, it's hitting that mainstream tipping point where, the the gains are gonna probably get smaller over time because the mass adoption there's just so much money there it's harder to move the market um so i i think there's there's mm -hmm. potential for bigger gains with the smaller coins but mm -hmm. you need to you need to either get lucky or know what you're doing um and have the time to to really invest and put into researching these things no doubt no doubt it's all it. luck it's all luck, I hear. It's all it's luck. All luck. <laughs> it's all it's all at this point, I, I really have a hard time understanding how anyone makes any money because it is literally all luck. Like I watch like how many shit coins, excuse my terminology, how many poop coins have have we spent the last month looking at or like I can't even tell you. Like there's little floku, little floku in you. Floku in no Shibu. The problem There's with that though, Black, is that we went Doge dogs. We, but we went chasing, man. <clears throat> we went chasing as a group. That was the issue. We literally went. That's Forte's retirement plan. Yeah, literally. It's my the dog coins. <laughs> Fuck a pension. Go after the meme coins, man. Man, that's that's yeah, that's that got everybody distracted. I feel like you know it's a lot of distractions out here in the streets. Uh, but I like those uh the crypto that you you've named but i'm not gonna lie alex you know when it turns your birthday i can't send you a bitcoin i can't do it i just cannot send you some bitcoin but <laughs> i will think about sending you some xlm you know so just write that down and i got you <laughs> yeah no i you think want, uh for, the, the way i'm looking at it is is utility that's utility what are these blockchains doing what are these coins doing because they all are they all fit a different um whatever a different uh use case and and that's that's the important thing if you're diving so like helium for example like i ordered some some helium miners like months ago i don't know when the hell those things are going to come but but like looking at at the the helium use case where they're building this decentralized network across the world and they actually just had a deal with dish dish is buying 3.5 million of their helium miners which are really just long fi hotspots in which they're, um, you know, they're, they're creating this network across the world, and then they're selling that um, that network to Dish, for example, or like other other companies who um, who have different use cases. For example, a scooter company. I, I can't remember the name of the scooter company. It might have been Bird. It might have been another one. But when people are riding these electric scooters on the street, and then they turn them off, some people steal them and like take them inside. Once mm -hmm. they get inside, the yeah, GPS can't crazy. can't track them. Yeah. So they so they're yeah. partnering with with Helium, and because of this long fi, this different um, signal that they use, they're able to track them in garages or in someone's house or what have GPS you to get these scooters indoors. back. Yeah. So Helium pays. So for anyone who who doesn't know Helium, they they have these. They call them miners, um, but they're really just hotspots that you plug into your house. It's like probably yeah. a few bucks a month in electricity. And they pay you in HNT coin to host on their on their network. It's a pretty cool model. So, so like a project like that, I I think you can see where it's headed um, with the utility. Don't they have? Um, wasn't it an app that they made where you can mine helium on your phone? Wasn't that? that I don't know. I know. I know they have an app where you can look and see all of the miners in existence and like you can go and and find a miner and see how much money it's been making um and it's all public right you know it's all transparent right there um but but it's literally like a 
box like this big. It's like a, a modem that you get from Time Warner Cable or fucking Comcast or whatever. I am so pissed at myself for not ordering one of those. We heard about this months ago. I think we were doing one of those. Uh, we, you know, we used to do these uh, spaces where it was like, you know, you know, pitch your coin or pitch your thing. And there were these women that came up here to talk about this helium. And they were like, oh, but it's on like six months backlog. But we, we were hearing about this back in what was that? June? Yeah, I didn't, about June. I didn't yeah, it was early. The coin was probably $8. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bitcoin was twenty nine thousand at the time, and David uh, David Goxstein, you know, CEO uh, founder of Goxstein Media, he was literally telling people, "Don't sell your Bitcoin, sell it to me, no gas fees included." <laughs> like he was just straight buying it. Like, man, now you look back at that twenty nine thousand, you're like, "Fuck, it. it was well worth it. It was well worth it." You know. I mean, um, yeah. think, think about the uh, the quote unquote dip we had yesterday and going on today. That started last night. Was like yesterday, you mean currently yeah. still? Yeah, currently still. Yeah. Um, so yeah. What do you think, what's your um, take on that? I bought some more. I don't know. There's no. There, like, I don't know. Nothing that scares me, but um, yeah, I I picked up some more some more Bitcoin. Um, I think for, from what I was saying, it was, you know, uh, liquidating some leverage longs, which yeah. happens every once in a while to flush them out. So, um, yeah, hopefully we, we keep going up after this, but I took advantage, bought a little bit more. What do they say? Sell green, buy red. Easy enough formula. Uh, <laughs> smart man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people buy high, sell low. <laughs> Yeah, well, see, like that's like, we were talking know, about man. that yesterday. We were talking about that yesterday, like intentionally taking losses in this crypto space, like intentionally going, all right, let me go ahead and take some loss. Like Dom was on that yesterday, right, Dom? Yeah, last night. We're doing that for uh, tax purposes, though. Yeah, makes sense. If you have a strategy behind it, then be great. A lot of people are just uh, scared. Yeah, I only do it on I only do it on things I didn't like I'm not sure about anyways. Like so like if I got into a play that because I, I, I really don't like even when I go to bed at night, like I don't I, for some reason I don't like stuff sitting in USDT. Like I rather, you know, put it in something. So I'm like, so I may put some I may put it in something just to see how it does. Uh, I may not have been sure about it, you know, and um, maybe I'll wake up the next morning. I'm like, oh, I'm down $10. There we go. You know, whatever, <laughs> you know, like, and then, you know, get out of it. <clears throat> Alex, have you opened your mind to NFTs? Uh, yeah, I have. I, uh, <laughs> I, I haven't done my research as much. Yeah. I bought, <laughs> I bought, I think it was like a month ago, a pudgy present. So it's literally just a fucking bouncing egg. So it, it's the pudgy penguin, like whatever community. And then the penguins, which are the same, it's just a, a penguin and they have all the different features. Um, and that these penguins had eggs. So now it's these eggs and they hatch on Christmas day. Nothing we don't. It becomes, it becomes something else. So like, you know, who knows what it's going to turn into, but it, it could be, you know, one or two ETH on Christmas day. And that's, that's the one present I'm excited to open on Christmas day, but I haven't gotten too involved in the, you know, the NFT communities, but um, my company that I'm working on, which is in the celebrity philanthropy space where we have a few partnerships with some NFT companies and we're going to be doing an NFT drop at our launch coming up. And um, you know, we're, we're definitely mm -hmm. um, getting in, on on the nft craze you could say but uh which i think is here to stay well alex let's let, tell us about that let, tell us about your non-soccer non-athletic non-full-time crypto uh non that you're you're building yeah so so it's a it's a for-profit company um and you know the name's parachute and this is a, a project that i've been working on for a few years now because as a professional athlete you know, I, I had this platform and this influence in the community and I wanted to find ways to give back. 
find ways to, to donate co- with causes or support different organizations. And in my experience, I found it was, it was difficult with finding organizations that you trust, you know, finding causes that you really believe in. Like, how do you go about this process? Um, you know, my agent, they, they focus on like the soccer side of it. And then the off the field stuff like is kind of on me. So I had to navigate this myself and I just kind of like stopped because I, I didn't know where to go or how to do it. Um, and then having conversations with, it was my girlfriend at the time, uh, my now fiance, who's a co-founder alongside with me, Kyle Dawson, she was in morning news and she was telling the news stories every day, um, but not providing any solution. And it was a lot of negativity. She wanted to like provide solutions. So she was stuck in her job feeling a lot of negativity. And then my teammate, Zach Steffen, who's now, um, we played together at Maryland and then Columbus crew. And now he's with the man city and the U S men's national team. Um, he was having these similar issues where it's like, we want to do more, but like, we don't know how the hell to do it. So the three of us, you know, have been, we co-founded parachute and been working on it for, um, a year now with angel investors out of New York city. And the idea is to, to build a social crowdfunding platform that, connects professional athletes and celebrities with vetted nonprofits and causes that they care about to increase awareness and donation for these organizations. So we're really, we're really impact driven. Um, we, we donate, you know, hundred percent of the, don- the, the donations that come through parachute go to the cause minus the, the credit card transaction fees. And then, you know, our revenue model is, um, is VIP community as we call it. So celebrities who join the platform will have their own VIP community. And that'll be like, you can be like inside the tent of your favorite celebrity. And what that means is they can do, you know, they can post exclusive content in there. They can give away prizes, whether that be signed jerseys, tickets to a game. It could be an NFT drop, um, benefiting, benefiting their community who, who is supporting the causes that they care about. Um, so we've been, we've been building this for, you know, the last year or so. And um, we're gearing up for Giving Tuesday of 2021. And that'll be our, our big launch day. And, you know, we've got, you know, 30 or 35 celebrities who, who are in our, in our network, in our roster, who are excited to jump on board, another 40 or 50 nonprofits who, who are um, going to jump on the platform. And we'll be launching a number of, of really dope projects and campaigns um, ahead of Giving Tuesday to, you know, impact the community and and, you know, for me as, as a soccer player, um, I always wanted to be more than just a soccer player. And soccer was like my vehicle to, um, you know, to meet guys like you, to, con- to connect with these different industries and, um, you know, for Parachute to make an impact for individuals all over the world. Um, you know, we're not only helping these athletes support causes that, that they've wanted to and, and haven't been able to support or haven't been able to find, making that process really easy on them but then impacting, you know, hopefully thousands and millions of people in the process. So, so that's been my, uh, my uh, evening job for the last year or so. And now our season's officially over. We, unfortunately we lost this last weekend. So I'm a, a full-time, you know, parachute CEO now, which is, uh, which is fun. Wow. Cause I tell you what, that, that, that's awesome. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a big supporter of what we do after our, our careers are over. Um, so, you know, congratulations on, on not that your career is over, but setting yourself up for when your career is over to be able to transition to something else. Cause I know there's going to be a lot of athletes that are always go, Oh, you guys make money. It's like, yo man, the money's not really made on the field. Like it used to be. I mean, it really isn't like most people are having to reinvest what they earn because if you do the mathematics, you're like, your potential for earning salaries with with professional sports is at max for most people. The highest rate is within seven year time frame, and at seven years, you're like after that, it's like okay, now what? Are you going to feed your mom, your dad, all your cousins who think you're still playing professionally off of that salary that you had seven years ago? No, you've got to you've got to expand it, and so um, making sure that there's that that aftermarket, but then also like the, how to financially become stable is something that a lot of people aren't educating folks on, like, especially like, you know, I remember when I left the sports world, I was like, well, hold on, I don't have any skills that they said that we were supposed to have. Like, you know, the internship over the summer, I was like, internships? Boy, I went over to Ireland and partied it up. So (laughs) 
I didn't know I think, that I think this is a, I think this is a really important topic because people lose sight of that. They look at professional athletes as these people who have it all, you know, they got all the money, all this, all that. And then the numbers show otherwise. It shows that, you know, they spend way too much while they're playing. And then once they're done playing, they don't even think about the next step until like the team says, Hey, you're, you're cut. And they're like, Oh shit. Like, okay, I gotta go look for a job. Like, how do I do that? You know, I, I've never had an interview in my life. How am I going to find a job? So it's important that that professional athletes are looking into that next phase earlier in their career because the transition is really, really hard for a lot of people unless you're doing your work, unless you're networking while you're playing and finding out what what interests you while you're playing. And, and that's, you know, that's a, a major reason why I'm also getting paid in Bitcoin because Bitcoin is, is money that I think I can count on in five years, 10 years, 20 years when I need it, when I'm done playing soccer. Um, and I think, I think more professional athletes are inevitably going to see that with, you know, you look at the inflation that we're seeing now, they say it's 6.2%, but they're taking this basket of the, the CPI basket and they're switching, they're putting whatever they want in there. You know, inflation is probably 14, 15% now. And people are going to wake up to that in a few years when they're going to get a, a cup of coffee and it's $8. And they're like, wait, what the fuck happened? It was $4 a couple of years ago. And uh, so, so I, I think inevitably more, more athletes, more individuals are going to start taking, taking some salary in Bitcoin um, because it, for me, it's like a savings account. That's money that, that I know I can count on. And it's a savings account that's earning, you know, whatever, 171% compounding over the last interest. decade. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so uh, how do you how do you kind of allocate those athletes into you know the world of crypto and taking bitcoin for those that are you know so kind of naive and kind of ignorant to the space how would you kind of go about doing so yeah it, you just have to educate them in a like a inclusive way um because i because they you know most the majority of of players and my teammates don't really understand bitcoin they they never did their homework they but, but they also don't understand stocks either so I, it's just in, in, um, educating them about investing their money and financial education. But Bitcoin specifically, it, you just have to be um, very smart about how you're, you're telling the story of Bitcoin and explaining like the different properties that it has, like the digital gold, digital property, um, the inflation that we're seeing and the sound money, the ability to transfer it over time and space. And, you know, I could take my ledger sitting over there. I could take that ledger, put it in my pocket, put, get on a plane with nothing in my hands and then go over to Nigeria, pull out my ledger and, and live a new life there. Like that, like that concept is so powerful, but a lot of individuals don't know that. So it, you know, it's just having conversations. I'm, I'm always, <laughs> I'm always like the Bitcoin guy in, in the locker room. If, if someone says Bitcoin, my ears perk up. I like move my mm -hmm. seat over there. And then I'm like, always oh, just, just talking, trying to, you know, let people, you know, just to, to tell them about it. Um, Cause the more you people you can bring into it and help them understand. Cause I'm someone that's like, I want to help you set yourself up because, you know, I'm doing my homework and I feel, you know, good and, and lucky about where I am today and the the moves that I've made and able to um, to set myself up for the future. And like, I want to help be the guys next to me who didn't don't have that experience or that education to like help them do the same thing. Um, so that, that's something that, that I'm pretty passionate about. And I'm always trying to, you know, talk to guys, educate guys and just loop them into the Bitcoin space. All right. Well, Alex, listen, we here at the big three and me always like to kind of bring everything back to the full circle. So at the very end, we ask our, our, our panelists their big three of the week. Now, your big three of the week can be any cryptocurrency that is not a legacy of Ethereum, Bitcoin, or Litecoin. So you can't do any of the three legacy ones, but you can, you, you know, you can play with Solana, you can, we're, we're, we're going to be flexible. We're not going to ask you for your poop coins. Just your big three, but they cannot be Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Litecoin. So, Alex, <clears throat> we'll, we'll come back to you last. We'll start this week off with Dom. Dominique, your big three this week. Do it. I am going with KDA, Flux, and VRA. 
All right. KDA Flux and VRA. Forte, your big three this week. I'm going to go Omi, Terra Luna, and then I'm going to go switch it up with Floki as my meme as my meme coin of the year, Floki. Uh, oh, you're going with Floki. Okay, you're coming out of left meme field. Of the year, yeah. You're coming out of left field. I'm going to have to go check the notes. The sandbox is killing it right now. I don't know why. Sandboxes? Yeah, like everything's red, but sandbox is like green. Sandbox and mana, probably. So, all right. Uh, Akeem, <laughs> what is your big three? Now, uh, my big three Solana, I got Raka, and I got UFO. That's my meme for the rest of the year and next year and next year. And next <laughs> you said UFO. So, UFO was, uh, you had UFO about two weeks ago. So, all right. I, I, just to let everybody know, I do take a log of like the crazy things that you guys say. And so I can come back with my receipts later on. All right. Uh, and for me, um, as always, um, Forte likes to take Omi away from me, even though. Yeah, I you're am. Welcome. yeah so Alex, uh, if you want to hear about a Bitcoin maxi, you have not met an Omi maxi like me. Uh, I've read the white paper. I, I harass the CEO. I've gotten it, I've gotten so bad, Alex, that the um, Jeremy Padwar, who is the person who owns the licensing for Pokemon, like he and I talk daily now. Like that's how big I am in the Omi. Like every day, I'm like, so when Pokemon? What's going on, Jeremy? What's when are we going to see the Pokemon? So that's my thing. I'm going to go with Omi as always. Yeah, I, I already use it. You can't use some. You can't use someone else's coin block. All right, you'll then go. So hey, you can't use that. You got to find uh, a new one. You can't use. Yeah, Alex, you, good man, good man, Alex, good man. So did anybody? All right, so uh, I've got BTT, okay, ILV, and Metaverse Index because I had you to. You just read my list from last week. No, because I have to. I have to go buy them all again. You read my <laughs> list from last week. <laughs> so what is them. what is Metaverse Index? Oh, Alex, you're gonna love this. Mm, that's that's awesome. no, 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 no. Before we go there, before we go there, I need my three. Okay, okay, okay so my yeah. three, my three. Um, I'll go Mana, this Decentraland, M A N A, um, Dot, mm. and mm -hmm. um, shit. Home runner, Alex. Home runner. Did someone say Solana already? Nikim did, yeah. I didn't. Did Akeem? I didn't have Akeem saying that. He said UFO. Oh, no, he said yeah. a lot, a yeah, lot of UFO. Yeah, yeah. All right, and then Link. Right, and then link. 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 Actually, no, 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 no. HNT. I'll go Helium because I was talking about it earlier. Okay. That's, all right. All right. Nice. All right. All right. That's my big three of the week. All right. So the Metaverse Index came about, um, and, and you're familiar with Sand Road, the investment group? No. Okay. But I will so be. Yeah, so there, there's the there's this investment group of like guys that invested into like Web 1.0, Web 2.0, and now they're investing in Web 3.0, and it's uh it's a it's an investment group called like basically Sand Road. Um, these are whales upon whales, like you know, and these are the guys that wear the Donald Duck ties in investment meetings and have stains all over their shirt. They're worth like ten billion dollars. You know what I mean? So these guys uh, put together an investment fund and they went into something called the Metaverse Index. There is literally a website that has an index for crypto. There's indexes for crypto. And so I'm happy to share that with you, Alex. Uh, but um, the Metaverse Index was one of them. And it lists all of the things that this group invested in for the Metaverse. So we will share that with you. Um, it is very, very good information. It is not financial advice in any way, shape, or form, but it's very, very good information. I mean, if Facebook is willing to change their name to Meta, then there's something involved with the metaverse in the first place. Right. So before, so before we wrap it up, we didn't hit sports at all. So <laughs> I have one. I have one. It's going to be quick. But basically, they're trying to make a certain athlete be a three-time, the first-time three-time Hall of Famer. I know, you just made that face. So, and they're making a case for it. You want to know who it is? Tom Brady. <laughs> so, 
basically they're saying his underdog career. So from 2000 to 2006, he won three Super Bowl titles. He was three Pro Bowl selections, two Super Bowl MVPs. From 2007 to 2013, they call that the GOAT career. He was two MVPs, two first-team All-Pros, and six Pro Bowl selections. And that's the one where the, most of his career where, you know, he was making it but couldn't get the couldn't get a Super Bowl. But his stats, they're saying, is a is a basically a Hall of Fame career stats. And then they have the Immortal, which is 2014 to 2020. What well, they call it on the Immortal? They call him the Immortal right now. That's crazy. <laughs> and that's four Super Bowls, one MVP, five Pro Bowl selections, Super Bowl MVP, first team all pro one. So they're saying, does this make a case for Tom Brady to be a three time Hall of Famer? Because he basically had three careers. No. Never career was a Hall of Fame career. <laughs> no, you don't get to be a, you don't get to get he doesn't career. have all three careers. You're just though. envious towards him, that's all it is. You're coming from he the doesn't back have day. three careers. He's got one career. Yeah, that's so that was kind of crazy to me. Um okay. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. Oh, what, you three jackets? His you career. Three, you give him three jackets, three heads, or what? And and yes, this is on ESPN. Come on. <laughs> that's mainstream media. one career. That's mainstream media coming at you with some bullshit. That is stupid. And that is it for sports. That's one career. You know what? I'm not even going to argue with it. You guys did that just to trigger me. So, Alex, I'm going to let you know. Tom Brady, I will call him the GOAT, but he's also, like, he's the worst dude. Like, anyone who can get two supermodels pregnant in the same cycle. Like, <laughs> they were married in the same they – were, they were pregnant during the same cycle. Like, you know what the chances are of that are, like, slim to none? That's, like, GOAT stuff, right? Yeah, he's I was just gonna say that's goat yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's goat stuff, man. That's, go that's all I said. I said he <laughs> is the goat, but the the fact that you did it is slim to oh. none, and I fucking hate you. He's like, a goat. I, I said he's the goat. Jealous, what is you're, you're just jealous of life. He's doesn't mean goat. doesn't mean he he's still the goat. I give him yes. that respect. So I don't I understand. How do you respect him but you don't like him? I don't, I don't understand. Just hold on. You act like it's synonymous that you have to like somebody that you respect. He's greatest of all time. But you don't have to like people. Like you can okay. respect somebody. But yeah, you but you don't like, like anybody, them. though. You don't like anybody. That you know what you are. You don't you like anybody. What? Look at you. What do you like? What kind of haircut is that? Akil, you do not like anybody. Like on Twitter, on your real life, nobody. He in has fact, a... you know, like Tom really kind of put, puts it in the jar for me that you live like nobody. It's a you. It's a you problem at this point. It's not even a them problem. It's a you problem. I didn't. I, no, I point things. Yeah, Akeem's laughing because you no, know it's true, man. Akeem laughing because you know it's true. Akeem is not laughing at me. Yeah, you know, I'm, that... I'm gonna quietly exit this um, conversation. Yeah, because because apparently Forte's haircut has also left this conversation. Where's, where's your haircut, Block? Good to see you got a haircut going on too. I'm bald, man. Who cares? By choice <laughs> or by nature? By choice. Oh shit. Look, you and that fade, that Canadian fade, man. That junk is just <laughs> y'all. So How have you recognized it? It's, it's, it's like a mullet on top. Oh, wow, bro. They are crazy. <laughs> All right. Well, Alex, Alex, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you, good brother. It's always good to have a fellow Terp on here. So that is number one. Number two, thank you for what you're doing for helping and inspire and empower younger communities and also um, to get um, those those people that are in the industry, the sports and entertainment industry, into the brand of life and hopefully get them linked up with uh, good opportunities. So we'll give you the last word before I sign off. Thank you, guys. No, I don't have much to say. I just appreciate you guys looping me in and, and bringing me on the show. It was nice to connect with you guys. And uh Excited for the rest of 2021 and we'll see what 2022 has in store for us. Alex, prediction prediction for Christmas, Bitcoin. Let's hear it. I asked you once, I'm going to ask you again. Let's hear it. Black, don't roll, don't roll your eyes at me, man. Um, we're, we're going six figures. Okay. I, I got my laser eyes. I got my laser eyes. By Christmas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, by Christmas. 
six figure Bitcoin. And then my pudgy present is going to turn into something incredible. And we're yeah. going to have a great Christmas day. Okay. And then I'm going to sell it to OpenSea. Well, I'll tell you what, if nice. you're invested in Oni, get ready because that is, it. you know what? It don't even matter. Black, and, you, can't, you can't fail to mention Omi at least once during every podcast or AMA, at least once. At, well, on this one, we've mentioned at least four times, so that's exactly why. Yeah, but you yourself are unable to know. And not on that note, thank you for joining us on The Big Three and Me. I'm your host, Akil Patterson, with my co-host, Akeem Hunt, Andrew Forte, Dominic Hamilton, and obviously our guest with Alex Alex Grinaldi. <laughs> Uh, and on behalf of the entire team of G-Media, we thank you. And as always, have a great day and an even better tomorrow.